Brian Raisinblu here. I'm the host of the Fit Growth Machine podcast, where we talk with top leaders in the fitness industry. Before introducing today's guest, let me tell you that this episode is brought to you by BSR Digital. At BSR Digital, we help fitness brands that want to scale their business to the next level through Facebook, Instagram, and Google Ads. BSR Digital knows that most e-commerce brands want to grow their sales, but they lack a solid plan and professional team to help them succeed. That's why BSR Digital offers strategic plans, implementation, optimization, and ad account audits to help more than a thousand e-commerce brands like yours grow their businesses and surpass their competitors. To learn more, visit bsrdigital.com or email us at hello at bsrdigital.com. So today we have an amazing guest. His name is Peter Keller, and he's the founder and CEO at Fringe Sports. Hey, Peter, thanks for being on the show. Ryan, what's up, man? It's so great to be here. By the way, I hear BSR Digital is freaking amazing. So I'm going to have to check them out. I'm so glad that they're sponsoring this episode. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, before getting started, I would love to give a shout out to Garrett Ackerson because he introduced us and he's great. So uh, thanks, Garrett. Heck yeah, thanks, Garrett. I had told you in the pre-show that if Garrett ever recommends I do anything, I basically just do it. Like, I love that guy. I, he's like a, a, you know, brother from another mother for me and I hold him in such high regard. And such a great e-commerce entrepreneur and CEO as well. Yeah, he's, in case you haven't listened to that episode, I interviewed uh, Garrett uh, a few months ago. So feel free to check it out because uh, it's a great episode as well. So yeah, now uh, about your company and you, of course, why don't you tell the audience what the company does? Awesome. Thank you so much. Put it simply, we improve lives through strength. And if you're just listening to this on audio, I'm showing my bicep right here. Bicep means strength. So improving lives through strength. And then what we actually do, how we improve lives through strength is we help people build amazing garage gyms. And secondarily, we also help entrepreneurs grow thriving local community gyms. And just to put it simply, we sell barbells to people who care just a little bit too much about barbells. Awesome. So this literally happens in the garage. I mean, a lot of great uh, startups uh, have started there, as we all know, but this literally starts there. So something great for yourself that can help you get stronger and many other things that we'll mention in a minute starts there and happens there. Yeah. Apple started in a garage, Microsoft started in a garage, Fringe Sports started in a garage. And come back and check with me in 10 years, we're going to be like that, like Apple, like Microsoft, all that stuff. Yeah, I'll be curious to hear about that story. How did the company start? Yeah, absolutely. So in a nutshell, I started doing CrossFit. But don't worry. Well, I am a CrossFitter. I'm not that guy. Uh, I do think CrossFit's amazing, but I'll let you make your own decision on that. But I started CrossFit in 2005, and one of the first editions of the CrossFit Journal, it's actually episode or edition number two, talks about the garage gym. And it makes an argument for you to go build and work out in your own garage gym. I drank the Kool-Aid. I did that. It was hard. It was really hard back in the day. Bumper plates, kettlebells, even quality barbells, all that stuff was hard to get. And by the way, I lived then and still live today in Austin, Texas. It's a very fit community. But even in this fit community, it was hard to get those, what I call the tools, the implements of elite fitness. So I was an e-commerce guy. I did eventually build out my garage gym, but I thought there's got to be a better way. So I dismantled my garage gym. Cry a little tear here. It was a sad day for me. And then I racked it out with some racks I bought from Home Depot and filled it with kettlebells and gymnastics rings and stuff like that. Started selling this stuff online with the idea of making it as easy as possible for our customers to build these amazing, amazing garage gyms or to grow their, what I call LCGs, local community gyms. And believe it or not, it actually worked. So from there, we just kind of expanded and grew and grew and grew. And over the years, what I realized is that what had happened to me in 2005 with CrossFit 
is strength had changed my life. And when I looked at our customers and whose lives were changing, you know, because there's one thing between selling a barbell to somebody and taking a few dollars, uh, you know, fair trade, whatnot. But that doesn't really ignite your heart necessarily or your emotion. But what I started to see is I started to see our clients who were also having those life-changing moments through strength. And then that's what really became the core of our company and went just down through the heart is helping people improve lives through strength. Whereas we might talk about in a little bit, especially yeah. giving strength to smarties. So strength for smart people. What's that? <laughs> strength for smarties. So I am a, an evangelist of strength. I am a gym rat. After college, I, by the way, I played rugby in college. And then after college, I actually started distance running, but I started training at 24 hour fitness, you know, trying to figure out what to do, stuff like that. And one of the things that I realized fairly early on, but then became just like crystal clear as time advanced is society, especially American society has this idea of strong people being dumb, being stupid. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a somewhat famous or infamous commercial for planet fitness. And there's this guy who's muscle bound. He looks kind of like a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger type. He's walking into a planet fitness and the desk attendant says, Oh, how can I help you? And the guy says, I lift things up and put them down. And then the attendant is walking him through the planet fitness. And all the guy says, he sees a machine. I lift things up. And I put the thing down. And so eventually he gets shown out the back door and the back door, boom, slams on him. Hey, not welcome here. Now, by the way, I'm not trying to crap on Planet Fitness here. I think that there's a place for kind of everybody in this landscape. Although I would urge you to head to a local community gym over a Planet Fitness if you can. But what I'm trying to make a broader point about is that a lot of society sees strong people as stupid or vain. And that is extremely far from the truth. Now, by the way, in any given population, you're going to tend to have an intelligence differential. You're going to have smart people. You're going to have dumb people whenever you take a more or less, you know, random sample of population. Same thing with strong people. However, the scientific studies bear it out that strength has a correlation with increased intelligence. And I could cite the scientific studies, but basically the way they measure it is by the strength of someone's hand grip. And, but anyways, there is a correlation between strong and smart. However, there's a paradox here that a lot of people, knowledge workers, computer programmers, marketers, executives, they still have a, that stigma of strong people being, you know, stupid or unintelligent and narcissistic and, and things like that. They have that in their head. So they'll go to conferences for training for their minds, but they won't spend the time training their bodies. And what I'm here to tell them is <clears throat> all else equal, stronger people are smarter, happier, and live longer lives, especially longer useful lives than less strong people. And it is simpler to get stronger than you may think it is. And so that's a major message of my life. Yeah, I, that's awesome and strong. And I, I, I always love reading between lines uh, whenever I, I can. And whenever I see someone, let's say someone strong, that tells me that the, the, that person had the discipline, the mindset, the consistency to go through the extraordinary effort that requires to get in that shape, right? So it tells you a lot about that person because it's easy to make fun, right? Of the, the other person. But then when you get yourself as, hey, but can I try that? Uh, will I have the mindset, the consistency? Because it's a long-term thing. And people, we as human beings, the vast majority of us hate the long-term thing. We want results overnight. And that doesn't work that way. So I, I truly believe that these people are smart for sure. And they have all the stuff that I mentioned. So um, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. So actually, this is something interesting. We had talked about Garrett earlier. 
there's a saying that he and I talk about sometimes when we chat, all discipline improves all discipline. So it's kind of a tautology, the snake eating its own tail. All discipline improves all discipline. And the idea there is that by being disciplined in one area of your life, it spills over into other areas of your life. And so I I really believe in that. Um, One thing I do want to mention as well when we're talking about it, there's a difference between strength and health. There's also a difference between strength and being skinny or having low fat or something like that. But all of these things can be a virtuous cycle together. And so your discipline in the strength area often tends, well, almost always tends to spill over into better health. So better discipline and better things in the health area. And which also tends to, in a little bit less of a way, spill over into healthier eating habits, which then go to body composition or generally speaking, you know, lower fat or more health in that area. Um, Yeah. And um, yeah, talking about discipline, there's another episode that you guys should check out uh, with Craig Valentine, the author of the Perfect Day and Perfect Week formula, both books. And and there are many more that don't come to mind right now. We talk a lot about discipline. So that's, I, I shared that, uh, what you said. I, I mean, it's it's really important to have the right discipline and for these two, of course. So I'd like to, 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 to talk briefly about the pandemic. And because I, I for example, <laughs> didn't imagine that to uh, exercise at home up until, I, I mean, I used to live in an apartment, not anymore. Uh, I'm a pandemial, let's say I moved to the summer <laughs> pandemic <laughs> with the baby twins. I, I, I couldn't stand it anymore in an apartment. But if I had a garage, it could have helped a lot, a workout better and exercise. But before that, I was like, oh, I go to the gym, to the gym I practice, but has it accelerated the, the, the business growth? I would love to hear about that and how you, it changed your business. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I remember it vividly. 2020 had started. We had some financial goals for 2020 as a business, and we were doing well towards those financial goals. And then on March 13th, no, sorry, March uh, 12th, I remember. I took a look at our Shopify. We run Shopify as a platform. I took a look at our Shopify numbers and I was like, huh, that's a pretty good day. As a 12th. Then the 13th, which was a Saturday, rolled around. I was like, well, that's a pretty good day for a Saturday. And the 14th, Sunday rolled around. Huh, Sunday's pretty good. And then Monday, March 15th, boom, it was just off to the races. It was like Black Friday, except we had done nothing to prepare for it. And orders, orders, orders. And then we sustained at a really high volume until we literally ran out of inventory. So it was crazy. It was all this panic buying. And I was looking inside myself. I was trying to figure out, like, what is driving all this panic buying? And what was driving it was, if you remember the early days of the pandemic, no one knew what was going on. People were saying, oh, the death rate is 3%. The death rate is 5%. By the way, if the death rate is 5%, that means if 20 people catch it, one person dies. And at that time, we didn't know about comorbidities. We didn't know that kids were relatively safe. We didn't know that elderly people were relatively unsafe. We even didn't know if masks worked. And so there's all this uncertainty in the air. However, if you bought a kettlebell or a pull-up bar, or a barbell set and you put it in, by the way, apartments. I talk a lot about garage gyms. Honestly, for me, a garage gym could be an apartment closet. It could be the trunk of a car. It doesn't have to be literally a garage. Although if it is literally a garage, that is like, you're my guy. That's that's the sort of thing that we're going for. So if you got those products, you all of a sudden could take some measure of your own health into your own two hands. Is the gym shut down? doesn't matter. I have it in my garage or in my closet or in the boot of my car. Can I not even go to work? Well, I can always work out. Some places they didn't even want you outside, of course, like to run or something like that. But hey, nobody ever said, don't go to your garage. Don't go to your closet. Don't go lift. So this 
mental certainty in the face of all this uncertainty drove this consumer buying pattern. Now, something else that that did, I have this thing that I talk about, garage gym revolution. Garage gym revolution. That is when people are, by the way, they're not putting their cars in the driveway and building a squat rack in their garage because the cars are already in their driveway. What they're doing is they're decluttering their garages and then putting in a squat rack, some barbells, some plates, all that stuff, a bench, and making that into a pain cave where they can change their life. That was already happening before the pandemic. But what the pandemic did is it accelerated that. I live in a suburb of Austin, Texas. And I, as I am doing this podcast, I can just look out and I can see my neighbor's garage right across the street. Before the pandemic, I used to walk my dogs down the street. And I would say that I would see a garage gym in maybe one out of 20 garages. So at 5%. Now it's more like one out of five to one out of 10. So we're talking 20%, 10%, 20% of garage gyms, you know, just from a straw poll here. So what it did is it just pushed forward this movement, this idea that you can or indeed should be training in your garage, garage gym revolution. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah. Do you, do you remember any key milestones that you're most proud of? <laughs> you know, the key milestones that I'm most proud of is all stuff that went wrong and then we recovered from. And when I say stuff that went wrong, it's usually stuff that I screwed up. So, but it's stuff that I learned from. So I would say one key milestone was actually, I had gone into business with my brother. And I love my brother. I got a bunch of brothers, but I, I love my brother. And I'd gone into business with him. And after four Anything. Now, after five years of doing business with him, it was terrible. We hated each other. I wanted business to go one way. He wanted business to go another way. And I'm not even saying my way was right. He just had a different idea for the where the business wanted, where he wanted the business to go. Maybe he was right. And I ended up buying him out of the business. It was absolutely terrible. Uh, I've been married to my wife for a long time, for almost 20 years. I've never been divorced, of course, been married to her forever. <laughs> and I love her. Love you, Valley. But that situation was my divorce. And Fringe Sport, my company, was the child. Except when you have a custody battle over a child, you can't do that old idea of, you know, King Solomon saying, well, cut the child in half. And then the person who says, well, I don't want the child to be cut in half. You can have him. And then that person ends up getting the child. With a business, you can cut the child in half. And by the way, a business might die because of that. And so we ended up, you know, basically cutting the child in half and then having this just animosity against each other. So, so in terms of me being proud, honestly, it's getting through that situation without the child, the business dying because it was tough, 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 tough. And then the next thing, the next part of that is that we've now... Now it's almost seven years later. It's a long time later. Recovering our relationship together and, and being able to be brothers again. Now, I know you're probably going to say, you're probably looking for me to say like, oh, we did this much revenue or something like that. Like, I mean, that's something, right? But for me, the hardest thing, I mean, business is all about people. And the hardest thing for me was navigating the, emotional side of that situation. And, and the biggest milestone for me is that my brother says that he loves me again. And I can say, I love you too, Alex. Oh, you're, you're going to make me cry. I don't cry easily. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, that was, that was something. I mean, um, I, I understand you perfectly. I know <laughs> It's not with a brother, but it's with uh, my closest, closest, closest friend. I went through a similar thing. We've been partners for 12 years. 
we started the first business we were in high school uh, or right after right after high school we were like 19 or so and then we opened the first office at the age of 20 then we went through some startups uh, with venture capital like we 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 did great and we did also terribly and in both moments we were there for each other uh, but then after many many years we get older we grow we mature and we choose different things to do with our lives beside the core business so we say oh i would like to go as as it happened with you i would like to go this direction and the other guy doesn't or is interested in some other projects so we part ways and as with your brother it is today that we um we could be in the same room and hang out and laugh but it's not the same thing so uh, uh i get what you're saying because he's not my brother but i've been friend with him since i was 13 years old so he's like the closest friend so um yeah it's a tough one and that probably has uh, many i mean has taught me many lessons one is that most people when they are starting a business and even more if it's their first their first business, all they care is about money, right? That's like <laughs> the first layer. That's the surface, right? Money, money. Oh, grow. I will partner with whoever I, I want. I will. But then money comes, goes, and then you learn that there are more, like there are deeper stuff, uh, more important than money. Money will come, right? But partner with the right person, uh, doing things right, be loyal to whoever you partner with, be loyal in business to your customers, to your team. So building the right team. So there are many, many important things because otherwise it's like, as we discussed uh, with a, uh, due to a different reason with uh, Tanner Larson in a recent episode, it's a leaky bucket, right? If business is not right in the, in the, in the inside, on the inside, it's a leaky bucket, right? Clients come and go. Uh, team come and go, like people come and go, and your emotions can go. Uh, it's a roller coaster. But yeah, anyway, I, I think it's um, it's something that we, most of us, go through when we have partners or someone close working with us. So I appreciate you you, you telling this. Yeah, my pleasure. I, I, I want to mention two things on that, and thank you for sharing your story of, of your partner. How do you define success? in life or business? This is a rhetorical question, by the way. <laughs> it's how, how is success defined in life or in business? Because I, I look at some people who are widely held up as these massive successes in business and venerated by many people, but then they seem to be fairly miserable <laughs> on the outside. And it, it makes me wonder, is that person really a success? You know, maybe they built something amazing, but are they, is their soul, <laughs> so, so to speak, successful? And, you know, I'm, this is a very small guy throwing stones at a very big guy. But like when you look at Elon Musk, certainly the man has molded reality to his will. On the other hand, if you just look at his tweets, you say, man, this guy does not seem very happy seems to be fairly miserable. And then you look at somebody else like Steve Jobs. Again, another man who has molded the universe to his will. And then you read things about how he was a miserable father to his daughter and how his uh, ex-girlfriend had to sue him to get his daughter, him to pay for his daughter's college. You know, going to, I think she went to Stanford, by the way. And when I look at that, I'm like, man, I don't know if this is a success. And, and so one of my goals with Fringe Sport, with my business, has been to help our customers immensely. And by the way, we have a goal of helping to build 1 million garage gyms. And by the way, we've built 100,000. So we're one-tenth. I'm one-tenth to being done. Then I can go do something else. No, that's Yeah, thank you. <laughs> But, but at the same time, and you know, you mentioned uh, your, your children, I'll mention my children. I've got a 12 year old and a nine year old, both daughters. I want them to know me as their father. And I wanna know what's going on in their lives. 
And my ultimate goal with them is I want to, I have this written down. I look at it often to raise healthy, happy adult children with whom I have a healthy relationship and I see often. So this is not, you know, now at 12 or nine, but when they're, you know, 25 years old, 30 years old, 45 years old, that, you know, we have a respectful adult relationship together and I get to see them a lot. That, that's a major goal in my life. And no matter what happens with business success or not success, that's what I need out of my life. Yeah, that, that's great that you bring this up because I read often two things. One the other day, the name doesn't matter. I I, I read on, I, 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 I mean, on Instagram, I saw a post of a super well-known influencer in the real estate industry uh, showing off his uh, like, I don't remember the title, but it was like my success or whatever. And it was like a photo of us of his plane, his helicopter, and his, uh, I don't remember what else the guy has. And I was thinking, what about your family, your daughter, your son, your uh, wife? Is that, isn't that your success? I mean, I know the guy is all about uh, showing up all the time, but, but it's like that thing. And then uh, many people, uh, as you said, they find success as uh, the money they accumulate and the things they do. And as you said, I have decided to, to consider success a balance between what I want in life uh, for my business, but why do I want the money for? Uh, I don't know if you read the book, um, The 4-Hour Workweek. I did, yeah. Uh, there's an analogy there, a, me a metaphor that is great. Uh, if, you're, if you haven't read it, you in the audience, please do icons do any spoilers right now but there's a beautiful analogy on the reason that you want to become wealth right the, the fishing guy you, you can read that in the book but it's like why and that opened my eyes and it's like no there's no way we we i i, I spend my life and my years trying to build an empire and then i look uh on my side and i don't have any any loved one yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a strong thing. So I, I encourage everyone listening, starting their business, ambitious to grow, keep being ambitious, but don't forget about why you're doing that. And if you want to be happy, who you choose for your relationships, your wife, your children, friends, keep them close and the business money again, come and go. But yeah. Um, oh, well, okay. So we're, I'm hijacking this a little bit, but one of the, here's one of the things. The journey is the point because okay. you're going to spend so much time on the journey. And I've, I've gotten to a lot of the quote unquote destinations that I wanted to get to in terms of business success, in terms of personal financial success, things like that. If you're one of these driven people, because I have a lot of friends who are very driven people, very business successful, very financial successful the reward is never what you think it is. Like when it's in front of your eyes and it's out of reach of your hands and you can't reach it, you think that the reward is something. And when I say reward, I'm talking about money. I'm talking about cars. I'm talking about planes. I'm talking about boats. I'm talking about houses, things like that. You always think that it's going to feel better than it does. And whenever you get it, it's empty. It always feels empty because you, you reach that level and then you feel a, you just feel this emptiness. Like what's next? Because you spent so much time obsessing over a goal and then you, re you reach it. And again, just to be clear, and just in my experience and that of my friends, it's never what you think it is. It's never as good as what you think it is. And then it's like, okay, back to the grind. And, yep. and the, grind, the grind is addicting. You know, you, anyways, I'll, I'll get off this, but the journey is the okay. point. So Stop. if- if you have family and friends, uh, coworkers, you know, the work, somebody recently said, the work works on you as much as you work on it. And so if the work is miserable, then you're going to be miserable because the work's working on you as much as you're working on it. On the other hand, for me, I had a barbell change my life. I had a life changing experience due to strength. When, when I was a kid, I always wanted to make the high school uh, soccer team. I would never make the high school soccer team. Uh, I did play rugby for the University of Texas, but I played it terribly. <laughs> but I, I was never like that 
strong person. I was never that athletic person. And when I was 25 years old, I fell in love with the barbell, had started an affair with the barbell, as I say, and it changed the trajectory of my life. And so back to fringe sport and what we're trying to do by helping people build amazing garage gyms and helping entrepreneurs grow these thriving local community gyms is inducting more people into the iron life, more smart people, and showing them how the barbell can change their life and can make their journey through life better. And I love that. And I genuinely believe in our mission. And is it too expensive to build a garage? Uh, a garage? <laughs> no. Uh, okay, let me tell you a quick story. I'm friends with Chad Vaughn. He represented the U.S. in the Olympics for Olympic weightlifting two times. Um, he got to become a national championship by working out on the crappiest barbell and weight plates that you could possibly imagine. He would drag a piece of plywood over to his dirt carport and he would work out with this intensity to get there. So, so the real point is it can cost almost as little or almost as much as you want. But you had mentioned before living in an apartment for, uh, previously. For me, the minimum viable garage gym, I call it MVGG, minimum viable garage gym, is a pull-up bar and a kettlebell. You could build world-class strength and fitness with a pull-up bar and a kettlebell, and we're talking like 200 bucks investment, maybe even less. On the other hand, if you want to outfit a garage gym, you could outfit one pretty good for about 1,000, 1,500 bucks. You could outfit one amazingly for $10,000, but it just depends on what you want. But by the way, your motivation, that story that I told earlier about Chad Vaughn, your motivation makes way more difference than your equipment. Oh, yeah. That's why we were talking before about, about mindset, determination, and the strength for smarties. So yeah, I I shared that. So uh, that's awesome. So uh, just curious, uh, how do you get um, traffic and sales for the business? What channel do you use? <laughs> I'm a massive, massive believer in content, email marketing, and search engine optimization. This stuff is not dead. So what we focus on is we focus on producing amazing content, much of which is user generated. And then we repurpose that content on our website to get good SEO, good traffic, good free traffic from Google. And then we repurpose that content in our email newsletters that we email out to our clients. By the way, as you listen to this, you might be like, email doesn't work. I hate receiving emails in my inbox. If you're that sort of person, take a look at your inbox over the next couple of days and notice what emails you like receiving. Because almost everyone, unless you're a complete misanthrope, has some sort of email that they enjoy receiving in their inbox. So for example, let me give you a couple of examples of companies that do this really well. So one is The Hustle. You've probably heard of it. Uh, email newsletter started by a gentleman named Sam Parr. He actually is here in Austin. The Hustle has great writing. I love receiving it personally in my inbox. I read most of those editions. Now let's go to e-commerce. Chubby's. Chubby's is a company that makes shorty shorts. Free the thighs is their big thing. Their marketing emails are hilarious. They have funny marketing emails. I love receiving their emails just because they're great at marketing. Let me go to another. Oh, man. There's another one that I'm forgetting that, that is a total pattern interrupt. But I'll mention a different one. So... I get emails from Beard Brand. And beard, you can see if you're watching the video that I've got quite a beard going here. To be honest, I normally don't have a beard, but I'm growing this one out for a year. So if you're following me on Instagram or something, you can see that. And Beard Brand 
their mission is, oh shoot, I'm going to forget it exactly how it is, but it's to increase men's confidence through grooming. I love that mission. And so I love receiving e emails and content around that. So back to my pitch for email marketing, it works. And people who are on email lists buy, you just have to put yourself in the position of your clients. What do they want? And then deliver them content around that. So for example, for our clients, I've already talked about GGR, Garage Gym Revolution. Our clients want to change their lives through strength. Some of them want to be thinner. Some of them want to bulk up. Some of them want to be stronger. Some of them want to be faster. Some of them want to look better. They want their clothes to fit better. There are all these different motivations. So feed those motivations. We create content around how to build an awesome garage gym, how an awesome garage gym can change your life. Hey, here's another client of ours. Here's their garage gym and here's how they built it and why. Hey, here's another client of ours. They lost a ton of weight using their garage gym. Here's their diet and why. Here's a great local community gym. How did they grow to be so great? Why are they so great? And by the way, that is what we call UGC, user-generated content. If you're listening to this and you're a brand owner, let me tell you a secret about UGC. Are you listening? Are you listening? It's cheap as hell. And by the way, people love to be featured in okay. your content. It is validating for them. You're going to put the content out. They're going to share it to their friends. They're going to put it on their Instagram. They're going to put it on their Facebook. And they're going to say, you, brand owner, you're awesome because you said that I'm awesome. So there's my pitch on content and UGC and email marketing, because that's what we do a lot of. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I share what you said. Email is not that content is not that whoever thinks that probably I'm not saying anybody's wrong, but there's a lot of proof <laughs> against them. Right. So, yeah, I love content. I love email marketing. But as you said, good uh, reaching good emails and valuable emails to me. So uh, that's that's awesome. So um, Shopify apps. If you, if you want, just re real quick, I'll give you my secret to SEO also. Oh, yeah. uh, you're, you're getting all my secrets out here. My secret to SEO is never trick Google. Always feed Google. Remember I mentioned earlier about content? Put your mind in the mind of one of your customers what would they want to see and open in their email? Now put yourself in the mind of Google when you're doing SEO and think, what does Google want? So from each search query, what Google wants is for the top organic result to be the best result in the world. How does Google know if it is or it isn't? It's if someone doesn't bounce after they land on a page. So they enter a query, they hit your page, and then they don't leave right away. And so then go and say, if someone's searching for a given search query, how can I make the most relevant possible page for them? No tricks, no nothing, just great, amazing content, which by the way is written, imagery, and video all together. And then make that page load fast. So many pages load slow as hell in this you know year of our lord 2021 there's no excuse for that i know internet speeds are faster than i've ever been just don't do it make fast pages and fast pages only all right sorry <laughs> i'll get off my soapbox now awesome i, I love secrets and all the stuff about this <laughs> but yeah great content is still uh i don't know if king but yeah it's it's super valuable and it's uh Besides feeding Google, he's feeding people and, and educating people on what you do, how to help them uh, get where they want to be and many other things. So I, I share that. So, um, yeah, you mentioned that you use Shopify, right? So um, I love Shopify. Yeah. Do you, can you recall any Shopify app or apps that have helped you uh, with different things, logistics or whatever? Yeah, I'm trying to think. And, and the reason that I'm trying to think is that we've been on Shopify for a long time. So some of the apps that were almost secret weapons at one point are now more or less standard or 
Shopify has taken them over in terms of what Shopify itself actually does with native functionality. Okay, so let me, I I mentioned email marketing before. I'm gonna mention two different email programs. And by the way, I've not ever tried Shopify's native, their relatively new native email marketing program. However, when our brand was smaller, had a smaller email list, I loved MailChimp. And I have to say, we're no longer using MailChimp right now because we've upgraded, quote unquote, to Klaviyo. I still have a soft spot in my heart for MailChimp. MailChimp is just, there are a few companies that just get it. So Shopify gets it. It understands just deeply in the DNA what its merchants need. MailChimp is another company that just gets it. They understand email marketing at such a a deep and fundamental level and are focused on their customers' businesses so well. So if you're just starting out, I know MailChimp has a free tier and then also they have some paid tiers. They're so good. So again, I haven't tried out Shopify's native email app. Maybe it's amazing. I don't know, but MailChimp's awesome. The next thing I would say is Klaviyo. So we upgraded from MailChimp to Klaviyo and I like wiped away a tear from my eye when I left MailChimp. I, I really do have just such warm feelings about MailChimp, but Klaviyo was an awesome upgrade. And the other great thing about Klaviyo is that they've got this large ecosystem of people who understand Klaviyo. So if you're having trouble with flows or this, that, or the other, and for whatever reason, you're not able to get the help directly from Klaviyo, which by the way, Klaviyo has great support. It's so easy to go on Fiverr or Upwork or somewhere like that, or you know, somewhere else and find someone who can help you with your Klaviyo. And then the other thing is Klaviyo has great, great training. Uh, full disclosure, I've never personally been to one of their trainings, but I have been to a few you know, e-commerce conferences that Klaviyo was in attendance. And they were like, hey, if you're a Klaviyo customer, we'll give you a free hour of consulting. And I'm like, sign me up. And so I've gone and talked with their people. And again, similar to MailChimp, they just get it. They understand merchants so well and what you need. So these may not be you know, a couple of secret apps or something like that. But MailChimp and Klaviyo have just been awesome and amazing partners to work with. Awesome. Yeah, I I love the two of them, as you said. And Klaviyo is a common one among uh, e-commerce owners uh, using Shopify. And it's a great one, super powerful. So that's awesome. What about mentors and or books? Any to recommend or any mentor that you would like to thank? uh, Because, I don't know, the way they help you throughout your career. Absolutely. So I'm going to give you some more secrets. I'm going to walk away. If you're on video, I'm going to walk away from video. I'm going to keep talking. There are three books that I keep beside my computer at all times. And by the way, I have these three books, both I'm in my home office right now. I have them here at my home office. I have them in my work office. I also have them in my Kindle and I probably have them on audible. So three books that are amazing while I'm walking to grab these books that I can show you. One of the things I want to mention is that I am a promiscuous book buyer. I buy books without any worry whatsoever. So for example, Brian, you told me in the pre-interview, which was a few weeks ago, you told me, oh, Peter, what you're saying is very similar to these things that Alex Ramosi says from uh, Jim Launch uh, is his company. And so immediately while we were on that call, I went to Amazon and I bought Alex Ramosi's book. And by the way, I bought it in two forms. I bought it in Kindle so I could have it right away and I could read it, you know, anywhere I have my iPhone. And I bought it in hard copy because you said, oh, this guy's amazing. And then I also, by the way, when you said that, I found him on YouTube and I just added a bunch of his videos to my YouTube watch later because you said, hey, this guy's amazing. And so I said, okay, I'm going to spend $20 or $30 on a book to see if he's amazing. And I'm going to spend an hour maybe watching YouTube while I do the dishes to see if this guy's amazing. And by the way, he's amazing. I love the stuff that, uh, that I do. So I've got the books now with me. So number one is going to be Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. So I've met Vern a few times and Scaling Up is, well, <laughs> the subhead is how a few companies make it and why the rest don't. And it has got, this is one of these business books that, so a lot of business books you buy 
and there's maybe one idea or maybe five ideas in the book and then they stretch it into 200 pages this is one of those books that's the opposite of that there's a thousand ideas in here that are in you know 250 pages it's it's honestly i love to read it's hard for me to read because there's so i like read it and i'm like okay uh, people oh i'm doing this wrong oh, i'm doing that wrong i'm doing that wrong oh crap i need to put this book down and fix that stuff so burn harnish scaling up number two traction by gino wickman now i've never met gino I mentioned i met Vern a few times traction is kind of like scaling up for dummies so both gino and Vern would probably hate that i describe it like that but that's kind of it so scaling up is really about eos entrepreneurial operate entrepreneurial excuse me operating system and how to run your business so this has really helped me to put structure into the business now the number three book that i always keep by me 80 20 sales and marketing by perry marshall so one of the things a, a warning that i want to give you about 80 20 sales and marketing is i bought traction for a bunch of people my employees people who aren't my employees and there's really a better book than traction called what the heck is eos to give people which really explains a little bit better EOS. I don't really buy scaling up for a ton of my employees because this is really more a book for me as managing the growth. I do buy 80, 20 sales and marketing for a lot of my employees. Some of them find it to be too difficult or too technical for them to really take action on it. But if you're in marketing or in sales, 80 20 sales and marketing is freaking amazing it's about how to do less and get more results or maybe let's say a different way to do more of what matters now to be clear it's not about laziness in any way whatsoever because if you implement this stuff you're going to be working your ass off well, but you're yeah you're going to be getting massive massive results so you had mentioned to me about mentors. You know, I have a therapist, I have a business coach, I have a bunch of entrepreneur friends. Uh, I, I have an e-commerce mastermind. I also am a member of EO Entrepreneurs Organization that has kind of a mastermind group inside it. You know, I wish I had a mentor, <laughs> but I, I don't have really a, a real like mentorship relationship with with anybody although i'm open to it so if you're listening to this and you're like i'm way more successful than that dude i'll teach him how to be as successful as me i'm in give me a call um but one thing that i do love is i love being in these mastermind groups or an eo and seeing what people are really doing because we're in digital marketing in one place or another. And you even kind of mentioned it before about the guy on Instagram who's like, here's my plane, here's my, my yacht, here's a big pile of money that I roll around in naked or whatever you do with a big pile of money, right? So the thing is, your car, you can rent a Lamborghini or a Ferrari for $500 or $1,000 a day, and then you can take a whole bunch of Instagram shots with it. Your private plane, you can literally rent a private plane that just sits in a hangar and then you can go and you can be in the private plane like, oh, here I am taking my coffee before I fly from New York to L.A. And then, you know, after the photo shoot's over, they're like, hey, get the hell out of the plane. Like you only get this for an hour. Um, you know, money, yacht, all stuff like that can all be fake. But a few of the organizations that I'm in, you get to see what people are really, really doing. And one of the crazy things that I realized is most of the stuff that really works both in like business and in marketing and stuff like that like people don't really tell you <laughs> what really works because they want to keep it a secret for themselves and so being in these organizations and seeing what people are really doing is really telling the, the other thing i'll tell you is i know a lot of people with really nice cars and stuff like that a lot of the people that i know with the nicest cars are really just living off of cash flow. They might make a lot of money or they might actually even not make a lot of money, but they're like spending money. 
like crazy. I know a few really, really wealthy people, and I don't know any really, really wealthy person that if you were they were just walking down the street, somebody would be like, hey, that guy's got $100 million. They would probably be like, oh, there's a guy. Like, his clothes are normal, He maybe even dumpy. So that's one of the things I learned, that a lot of those people flaunting the money, they don't really have the money. Of course, it's it's great to get advice from the right people, of course, and people that are, are doing, as you said. So, yeah, uh, where can people go to learn more about you and your company? Yeah, www.fringesport.com or we're on Instagram at Fringe Sport. So if you're listening this far, I want to make an ask of you. If anything that I've said about Strength for Smarties sounds good or sounds interesting and make a commitment to yourself just say that hey i'm gonna do four weeks of some sort of strength activity three times a week and by the way it can be push-ups it can be running a couple of sprints it could be pull-ups it could be i love kettlebells and barbells so better yet if it's that but strength changed my life. I went from being the kid who was always picked last in dodgeball and in, in sixth grade would always get bah! the dodgeball up the side of my face to the guy who can, at this point, kind of do almost anything athletically that I want to on pretty much a moment's notice. It's made all elements of my life better. I sleep better. I work better. I think more clearly due to the like dopamine release of working out. I mean, it makes your sex life better if you're shallow like that. I am too. So, so make a small commitment to make a small change around strength. And if you want to find out more information, find us at fringesport.com. Look at our blog. We've got a bunch of resources there, or even just reach out to me directly, peter at fringesport.com. Strength changed my life and it can change yours too. That's awesome. Thank you, Peter, for being on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Awesome. My pleasure, Brian.